Uh, before we get into it, this is just a great group to decide high pulpits. Good idea, bad idea? What do you think? Come on. Who said it? What's your name? Robbie? Robert. Robert, why is it a good idea? You mean the person for the person sitting there? Well, I, I think the pew is contributing to that, Robert. All right, anything else? Other ideas? We have one pro. Anybody else? Yep. Name? Jordan, why is that a bad idea? Right. Okay. So I've got, I've got a, it's good for the posture of the hearer. It's bad for the pride of the preacher. All right. Anything else? Any other ideas? Yep. Come on. These are very practical. This will matter when you're in the pastor, pastor more than half the classes you've had. Yep. You like the symbolism of it. Okay. Spiritually dangerous, but if you can take the high altitude for your pride, it's, it's a good symbol. All right. Somebody else. Other arguments. Yep. Name. Boom, thank you. Finally, a very practical argument. People can see you better. All right, any other arguments? Pro or con? The only con argument so far has been the pride of the preacher, which I have to tell you, if this is like the dominating thing that determines whether or not you're prideful, you have a very strange mind. I mean, I can understand that if you have to come with an argument, that might be there, but your daily life is going to be full of so much more stuff that the height of the lectern will not be high in your thoughts, I think. I would just say, as somebody who's preached in a lot of different kind of pulpits, 1970s love down on the floor to have the symbolism of there's no difference. Uh, I think that's ridiculous. It's really harmful for the people in the back. You get up here, you can see everybody much more easily. I would basically say the higher the better. I mean, the symbolism for it is, is okay. I preach in Terry Johnson's Independent Press down in Savannah, Georgia, and it's like way up there. I can like look across and slightly down at the people in the balcony. And... Uh, <laughs> But I tell you, as a preacher, it is useful because everybody can see you. And for the congregation, you can see the preacher very easily. So, so preachers, I see young preachers doing this again and again. Like here, they would get down there specifically because they don't want to look like they're above anybody else. And while I appreciate the humility in that, you've just made it harder for everybody but the people sitting right here to see you. And if there's no microphone, to hear you. So I think you, basically, you will serve everybody by getting up as high as you can, basically. So it may sound strange, but free wisdom. Now, yesterday, we considered the symbol and significance of preaching. Uh, it's very methodological form, kind of like the height of this pulpit. We said, symbolizes God's grace to us and the means by which God's grace comes to us. Uh, we thought about the gender of the preacher and how the gender reminds us of the authority of God himself. And we thought of preaching significance being central in the congregation, especially to the work of the Christian minister. And finally, we said that the proclamation of the gospel is central to any true Christian preaching. That's what we said yesterday about the symbol and significance of preaching. Today, we want to turn to the use of preaching, the use of preaching. And we particularly want to consider its use in edifying the church, that's where I'll spend most of my time, and also in evangelizing the lost. Those will be my two main points. To begin with, though, I just want to consider the effect of preaching at all. Let me first just argue for the simple fact that preaching should make a difference before I turn to the differences it should make. I mean, if you think about it, how much preaching this past Lord's Day just reinforced the surrounding culture? Surely more than we would hope. I don't know how it would be otherwise when, as one trustee of one of the largest evangelical agencies in the world told me not too long ago, people are referred to relentlessly as clients. And customers. When a best selling evangelical book seems to assume that if someone wants meaning and purpose and direction in their lives, they have effectively repented of their sins against God and been converted. Several years ago, the Methodist writer Bill McKibbins made these observations in an article in Harper's entitled The Christian Paradox How a Faithful Nation Gets Jesus Wrong. McKibbins wrote about the preaching in evangelical megachurches. It looks so much like the rest of the culture. In fact, most of what gets preached in these palaces isn't loony at all. It's disturbingly conventional. The pastors focus relentlessly on you and your individual needs. Their goal is to serve as consumers, not communities, but individuals. Seekers is the term of art. People who feel the need for some spirituality in their or their children's lives, 
but who aren't tightly bound to any particular denomination or school of thought. The result is often a kind of soft focus, comfortable suburban faith. A New York Times reporter visiting one booming megachurch outside Phoenix recently found the typical scene, a drive through latte stand, Krispy Kreme donuts at every service, and sermons about how to discipline your children, how to reach your professional goals, how to invest your money, how to reduce your debt. On Sundays, children played with church-distributed Xboxes, and many congregants had signed up for a twice-weekly aerobics class called Firm Believers. <laughs> Abdication is leading as much or more as godly initiative-taking, isn't it? A boat unsteered floats downstream with the current, liable to all the eddies and rocks and sandbars with no guidance to protect her. So many churches have preachers which look to the culture outside, not simply for the most appropriate methods, but it seems even for the most acceptable parts of the message to be preached. Some churches track with the culture so much that they become indistinguishable from it. But friends, Christian preaching is to dare to make a difference. Logical arguments and careful illustrations are to have an effect on those who listen. Our whole salvation as Christians hangs on having heard God when he was against us in our previous course of life. A change needed to happen, and it was affected through the hearing of a message. It's the same still with our preaching. Have we come to Christ? Uh, we are now informed by preaching. We are now informed by instructing our minds, educating our consciences, warming our hearts. And preaching is to do this by presenting to us the truth of God's Word. As one example of this idea of preaching for effect, uh, consider the instructions for preachers in the Westminster Directory of Public Worship from the 1640s. When it comes to dealing with sin, we read in the directory, quote, in dehortation, reprehension, and public admonition, which require special wisdom, let him, as there shall be cause, not only discover the nature and greatness of the sin with the misery attending it, but also show the danger his hearers are in to be overtaken and surprised by it, together with the remedies and best way to avoid it. Now, if you break that down, you find much that could be dismissed as mere moralism if divorced from the proclamation of the gospel. But preaching for effect in people's lives in no way necessarily undermines the sheerness of the grace of God in the gospel. The working out of the gospel, in fact, requires these kinds of careful considerations. So denunciations of specific actions are appropriate. You look at the New Testament. How many, how many of the books of the New Testament are just full of warning passages? Paul's letter to the Galatians is full of admonitions. Uh, the heeding of which in no way undermines the gracious character of the gospel. What I'm saying is that we have to be very careful in our reformational concern for the priority of God's objective action in Christ, never to undermine the complete necessity of our subjective appropriation of God's provision in Christ. And I'm saying that because I see that as a problem in young preachers who somehow learn to read their Bibles. It tells us to do this, this in the imperative, but if I leave it there, that's legalism. So now I'll tell you that we can't do it because of sin, and I'll tell you Christ did it, yay, and then that's the gospel, and they're done with their sermon. It doesn't matter what the passage is. You are a terrible preacher if you preach like that. That is not what the Bible says. Those words are true. Those sentences run along in the core of the gospel, but the Bible has much more to say than that. God's Spirit inspired more than that. If we want to completely appropriate what God has provided for us in Christ, that will include logical thinking and moral instruction. It was Jesus himself, friends, who commanded us to repent and believe. Had he wished, he could have left his church's passive visual images of the gospel, commanding us to, to watch the sunrise as a great icon of the resurrection, or to simply watch the sun set as an icon of his promised return. He could have observed, told us to observe the, the running river or the growing grain. Instead, what he did is he ordained those who follow him to get in the water and to eat the bread. 
participatory events where we, his followers, are included in what he has objectively prepared. So God's action and our response is the biblical pattern for being a Christian and friends. That's the biblical pattern for our preaching. So be very careful in your desire to avoid moralism and champion grace to not fall into the sophomoric error of thinking any imperative verb is legalism. That is not true. Our preaching should have an effect. Paul's words to the Corinthians, uh, it is clear, in fact, that Christian preaching will have an effect. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning with verse 14. Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are the smell of death, to the other the fragrance of life. And who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity like men sent from God. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. Not that we are competent to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. Friends, we preach for change. And we preach desiring particular changes in our churches. In everything from the way in which the ministers deals from the pulpit with theological disputes or with divisions in the congregation, with objectors to the Christian faith, the Christian preacher is to lead and guide, to instruct and to shape the church. Then that brings us to one of the two chief uses of preaching. So that would be edification. Edification. The most extended treatment in the New Testament of what the Christian gathering should be like is where? Name a book in the New Testament. Is it first or second? Which chapters? 14. I'd say really 11 to 14. So if you want to look at the New Testament for an example of what those earliest Christian gatherings were like, that's the most extended treatment we have. Paul's chief concern of all that is well summarized in a phrase that occurs a few times. If you look in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26, uh, this is one of those verses that as a pastor should probably hang on your wall in your study. All of these must be done for the strengthening of the church. Really, throughout 1 Corinthians, this is Paul's standard for deciding what should be done in the congregation. Well, friends, it follows then that such a standard of usefulness and edification should especially be applied to that which we'd argued yesterday was central to the Christian congregation, preaching. What preaching will tend most to the edifying of the church? We should ask that about our singing. We should ask that about our praying. We should ask that about other aspects of our meeting. We should certainly ask that about our preaching. And I think the answer must certainly be teaching which exposes God's Word to God's people. And certainly not all preaching is so biblical. John Broadus once quipped that if some sermons had the smallpox, the text would never catch it. I mean, do you have any doubt that expositional preaching should be the basic diet of preaching in your congregation? When God gave Moses instructions for the kings that would surely come in Israel, do you remember what they were required to do? In Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 18, we read, When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law taken from that of the priests who are Levites. It is to be with him, and he is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees and not consider himself better than his brothers, and turn from the law to the right or to the left. Mandated royal quiet times, right there in Deuteronomy chapter 17. Friends, such a, a practice is consistent with the priority of God's word that we were thinking about yesterday. What, what marks the righteous man in Psalm 1? 
He delights in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. You go to Psalm 119, and this is echoed in stanza after stanza. Seven times a day I praise you for your righteous laws. I obey your statutes, for I love them greatly. Your law is my delight. Okay, given that delight in God's word, delivering that very word is to be the wonderful burden of Christian preaching. Furthermore, given the the fact that we live in a literate age where the printed word, both on the page and electronically on our cell phones, is familiar to us all, Uh, where God's Word has been chapterized and versified and translated and made readily available, why would we not take advantage of that in our preaching? Earlier ministers, when preachers had few of these advantages, Chrysostom, Augustine, others, uh, regularly preached consecutive series of sermons through set portions of Scripture. In one of his sermons on Lazarus and the rich man, Chrysostom said, I often tell you many days in advance the subject of what I'm going to say, in order that you may take up the book in the intervening days, go over the whole passage, learn both what is said and what is left out, and so make your understanding more ready to learn when you hear what I will say afterwards. That's Chrysostom. That's not from the Enlightenment. In such a commitment to bring his people God's word, I think Chrysostom was simply following in the footsteps of Moses that Jethro charged with teaching the people the law. He was following the footsteps of Josiah, who read in the people's hearing in 2 Chronicles 34 all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the temple of the Lord. He was following the steps of Ezra and the returning Levites, who we read in Nehemiah 8, read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was being read. So friends, this pattern of the teaching of God's word being central to the gathering of God's people continued into the time of Christ. The whole synagogue movement. You think of the synagogues of Jesus' day where they would read through the scriptures in a lectionary cycle of a year or two. The Babylonian cycle seemed to be different than the Palestinian cycle, but nevertheless, there, was, there were these cycles. Comments would then be made. This is exactly what we see Jesus doing in, in you know, Mark 1, Luke 4, in, that, in the Nazareth synagogue. Now, exactly how much the first churches were modeled after the synagogue meetings of the time is impossible to determine, and therefore a superb topic for your Ph.D., Nevertheless, the expositional series that survive from Chrysostom and other even earlier Christian preachers suggest that the consecutive expositional pattern was widespread. Uh, The sermons or summaries of sermons in the New Testament are few in number. They show a concern to be relevant to the hearer's cultural setting, but even more fundamentally to be rooted in the Scriptures. You think of Paul in Acts 17. He's preaching to inform the illiterate Athenians, uh, the biblically illiterate Athenians. Of course, the early Christians lacked some of our advantages, like having the Scripture text available to them to be examined even during the sermon, so the mechanics of expositional preaching would more often rely on mnemonic devices for the memory, like uh, the repetition of the lectionary. But, as we observed yesterday, Peter's sermon at Pentecost seems to have substantially been a meditation, exposition, and application of portions of Joel chapter 2, about what they were seeing around them, and then Psalms 16 and 110. Or if you go to the writer of the Hebrews, he spends long sections instructing on Psalm 95, that's in chapters 3 and 4, and Psalm 110 in chapter 7. So friends, in all this we can see that it's good to preach the truth, it's even better to preach it in such a way that people can see where they can get the truth. C.E.B. Cranfield, late professor at Durham, said, quote, the practice of preaching through biblical books section by section in order can be, I have long believed, if followed intelligently and sensitively, enormously beneficial to the church, close quote. And this is true whether the texts are from the Old Testament or the New, whether they are single verses or long passages. Let me speak for a moment about various types of texts. Now, sometimes the assumption seems to be made that only the New Testament should be preached. But surely every part of Scripture has its contribution to make in edifying our congregations. It's in the Old Testament that we find the foundational truths of creation and redemption the origins of marriage and of the people of God. It's in the Old Testament that we see God's faithfulness to His unfaithful people stretched out, not over the the decades of the New Testament church, but over the millennia of the history of God's dealing with Israel. Churches profit from being instructed in every genre of Scripture. Law, history, writings, prophets, gospels, epistles. Why should the Christian preacher not alternate back and forth between 
these various genres, slowly working his way through the scriptures, thereby informing his congregation how better to understand each part of God's word and instructing them in the great truths of God and of the gospel in it all. New Testament series could generally be longer than those of Old Testament books, but in none of them should the books be understood and preached apart from Christ and his cross. If such variety were typical of our preaching, our congregations would be better equipped to read and understand the scriptures, all of which have been inspired for their good. So various types of texts should be preached expositionally, but also I would argue various levels of text. I think this commitment to preach expositionally also need not determine that sermons are always in your particular style. Maybe you think as a preacher you've developed a style where you preach paragraph at a time, verse at a time, phrase at a time, word at a time, chapter at a time. Friends, whatever level of text is considered, there are advantages to be had. From preaching on the message of the entire Bible in one sermon, you'd call it promises made, promises kept, to doing a a five-week series on temptation from 1 Corinthians 10, 13. The advantages of sermons on a single verse, I think, are widely known. Clear explanation of God's Word is given. Lots of grammatical education can be had. Difficulties are resolved. Truths can be sweetly meditated upon. Much time can be given to application. But large texts also can build up the church uniquely. Overview sermons have the advantage of giving the Christian the big picture. And friends, in times of trial and persecution, the big picture can be encouraging. Remember how God encouraged the aged John when he was imprisoned on Patmos? He gave him an expansive overview of his work throughout history. So setting the stories of Jeroboam or Isaiah in their historical context simply make them more meaningful. The whole pattern of Israel's history preaches to us of our unfaithfulness and God's amazing trustworthiness. If you'd like to read more about variety in expositional preaching, You'll find material I hope will be useful to you on the Nine Marks website. Just go to ninemarks.org, look under expositional preaching. Also, though, a word on application. And not just on what text to preach on, but also on application. Such expositional sermons, whatever the size of the text being expounded, can edify the church as the passage is explained and applied carefully. I think this is one of the great strengths of Puritan preaching. I'm amazed at those brothers' patience in observing the human condition and knowing their own hearts to be able to give the attention they do to application. So William Perkins, in one of the earliest works in English on preaching, uh, the art of prophesying, said in chapter 7 that the preacher should remind himself of the different kinds of people there are hearing each of our sermons. There are those who are unbelievers, who are unteachable. He says they need explosions under them. There are those who are teachable but ignorant and so need the application particularly clearly spelled out in detail for them. There are those who have some accurate knowledge, but who are not yet humbled. For them, the truth preached must be applied in a way which rips up at their conscience. And there are those who are humbled already. For these, you must bring comfort and encouraging applications. They must be shown that the Lord accepts weak faith. Then there are believers who need to understand the gospel as it touches justification and sanctification and perseverance and they all need to be taught to be holy and then there are those who are are fallen whether in their faith or in their lives perhaps into heresy through a mistake or through sin through disobedience so it's the obligation of the preacher to work out applications of the truth which encourage their recovery and there are those other people mingled in those whom you don't know well whose hearts therefore are hidden from you and to them the truth of the gospel needs to be spelled out clearly all these groups perkins argued should have application laid out particularly for them. So surely our churches today would be built up by expositions more thoroughly applied. Personally, I use a grid for meditating during preparation. So with the help of that grid, I try to consider each point of the sermon in the light of what may be unique within it in terms of redemption history, in light of what it says particularly to non-Christians, if it has any public implications, how it points to Christ, uh, what it says to us at work, uh, in our marriages and families, uh, as individual Christians, and what it says to our specific local congregation. Uh, Many of us are called to preach God's word 
will surely know this already, but it will be helpful to remind ourselves again of this fact. Not only are there different kinds of hearers, but there are also different kinds of application, all of which themselves are legitimately considered application. I sometimes will find a preacher who is particularly interested in and maybe strong at one kind of application, but then he views everyone's sermon on the basis of how good are they at this kind of application. And I would rather us back off a little bit and say, you know, there are different kinds of really powerful applications. And preachers are variously gifted at them and praise God for the different instruments he places in his orchestra. When I preach the word, I'm called to expound the scripture, to take a passage of God's word, to explain it clearly, compellingly, even urgently. And in this process, there are at least three different kinds of applications which reflect three different kinds of problems we find in our own Christian pilgrimage. So let me suggest these three as examples. You can come up with an infinite list. First, we struggle under the blight of ignorance. Second, we wrestle with doubt, often more at first than we realize, I think. Finally, we sin, whether through direct disobedient acts or through sinful negligence. Now, all of these, the preacher longs to see change in our own hearts, but certainly also in the hearts of those that we preach God's word to. And each gives rise to a different kind of legitimate application in our preaching. So ignorance. Well, ignorance is a fundamental problem in a fallen world. We've alienated God from us. We've cut ourselves off from direct fellowship with our Creator. It's not surprising then that informing people of the truth about God is itself a type of powerful application. In fact, I think it's the most powerful type. It's the one we desperately need. This is not an excuse for cold or passionless sermons. Friends, I can be every bit excited and more by indicative statements as I can be by imperative commands. The commands of the gospel to repent and believe mean nothing apart from the indicative statements about God, ourselves, and Christ. Information is vital. We are called to teach the truth, to proclaim a great message about God. We want people who hear our message to change from ignorance to knowledge of the truth. Implications carefully traced out can be transforming. Such heartfelt informing is application. I think one of the most powerful sermons I remember hearing was by Dick Lucas. Uh, Dick was the minister for 40 years of St. Helens Bishop's Gate in London, strong evangelical Anglican pulpit in the middle of London. He was preaching a very straightforward sermon uh, on the crucifixion in Mark's Gospel. And at the end, he simply gets to talking about the crucifixion, and he says, there, it's all done. There's nothing left for us to do. All our sins paid for. And that's how he ended, and then closed in prayer. And so it was a powerful message as Dick slowly, carefully led up to the cross and its significance. He didn't have any imperative verbs. It would have been entirely appropriate for him to do that. But I simply want to point out that even without imperative verbs, he had so preached that it was clear what the significance of the death of Christ was. And informing us of that is not the only way you want to preach, but it is the single most important thing in your preaching. And it in and of itself, I think, is a legitimate kind of application because it corrects our ignorance. Doubt is one of the other things we struggle with. It's different than simple ignorance. In doubt, we take ideas or truths familiar to us and we question them. And this kind of questioning is not rare among Christians. In fact, doubt, I think, may be one of the most important issues to be thoughtfully explored and thoroughly challenged in our preaching. I think we may sometimes imagine that a little pre-conversion apologetics is the only time we preachers need to directly address doubt. But that's not the case. Uh, some people who sat and listened to your sermon last Sunday, who knew all the facts that you mentioned about Christ or God or Onesimus, may well have been struggling with whether or not they really believed those very facts to be true. Sometimes such doubt is not even articulated. We may not even be aware of it ourselves. But when we begin searchingly to consider Scripture, we find lingering in the shadows questions and uncertainties and hesitancies, and all of which make us sadly aware of the gravitational pull of doubt off there in the distance, drawing us away from the faithful pilgrim's path. To such people, perhaps to such parts of our own hearts, we want to argue for and to urge the truthfulness of God's Word. 
and the urgency of believing it. We're called to urge on hearers the truthfulness of God's Word. We want people to hear our messages and to change from doubt to full-hearted belief of the truth. Such, such urgent, searching preaching of the truth is another kind of application. And sin, of course, is our problem in this fallen world. Ignorance and doubt may be either themselves specific sins or the result of specific sins or neither. But sin is certainly more than neglect or doubt. Be assured that people listening to your sermons will have struggled with disobeying God in the week that just, just passed, and they will almost certainly struggle with disobeying Him in the week that's just beginning. Their sins will be various. Some will be the disobedience of action. Others will be the disobedience of inaction. But whether of commission or omission, sins are disobedience to God. And part of what we do when we preach is to challenge God's people to a holiness of life that will reflect the beautiful and delightful holiness of God himself. So part of the application of the passage of Scripture that we're preaching is to draw out what the implications of that passage are for our actions this week. We as preachers are called to exhort God's people to obedience to his word. We want people to hear our message and by hearing to change from sinful disobedience to joyful, glad obedience to God according to his revealed word. And such exhortation to obedience is certainly application. So to return to what we concluded with yesterday, the main application of every message is the gospel. Some people do not yet know the good news of Jesus Christ. Some people sitting under your preaching have been distracted or asleep or daydreaming or otherwise not paying attention. They need to be informed of the gospel. They need to be told. Others may have heard and understood and perhaps even genuinely accepted the truth but now find themselves struggling with doubt in the very matters that you were addressing or assuming in your message. And such people need to be urged to believe the truth of the good news of Christ. And two, people may have heard and understood, but may be slow to repent of their sins. They may not doubt the truth of what you're saying. They may simply be slow to, to turn to Christ. For such hearers, the most powerful application you can make is to exhort them to hate their sins and to flee to Christ. In all our sermons, we should seek to apply the gospel by informing and by urging and by exhorting. One common challenge we preachers face in applying God's word in our sermons is that sometimes those who have their problems mainly in one area or another will think that you are not applying scriptures in your preaching if you're not addressing their particular problem. I, I get this complaint probably on the average of every other week. Somebody will tell me that I, I don't do any application in my sermons because I'm not addressing a topic that they particularly are concerned about. And they only really have ears for that. Well, are they right when they say you have no application in your preaching? Well, maybe, but not necessarily. While your preaching might improve if you do start addressing, for instance, doubt more often or more thoroughly. It's not wrong for you to preach to those who need to be informed or who need to be exhorted to forsake sin for the benefit of all of God's people. How else should preaching be used for edifying the church? Well, the sermon should point to other resources. Friends, I would encourage you, educate your listeners by referring them to good books for fuller treatments. Have a library in your church stocked with biblically faithful books. One of my first acts of pastoring my church was throwing out 80% of the library. You know, it's just the way I love the sheep. Look through the books, take the time, find the silly stuff, get it out of there. You know, if they're gonna, so you're not just looking for heretical books. You don't, you, it doesn't have to be the Book of Mormon. I mean, it can be just a silly time-wasting book. When if your people are not going to give much time to reading, make sure what they read is worthwhile. So go through, and if you have to go through some library committee, disciple them or get rid of them somehow, but just get rid of the bad books. You know, for the congregation, put in good faithful books. Also, you can have a place where books are sold in your church. Encourage people to buy them. So almost every Sunday and Wednesday night, I've been at the Capitol Baptist Church over 22 years now. I've given out one, two, or even five books. And I have encouraged them to get copies and read books by everybody from Jonathan Edwards to J.I. Packer to Don Carson. So teach people about charity and its fruits and about evangelism and the sovereignty of God. Give out books at every chance. Oh, look at this. I've got some copies of books right here. You know, 
here's this new book I've done on God and politics. This is just one sermon I preached from Mark's Gospel. If you want a copy of this, Charles and Shaker are going to bring you copies right now. All right, Shaker, you start at the back. Charles, you start at the front. Just put up your hand. You want a free copy? There it is. Just, but do not take it unless you're going to read it. Do not just put this for reference on your shelf. You know, this is a gift for you to read, and I'm also modeling what you should be doing at your church. All right? If you particularly need to understand the congregation's authority better, understand the congregation's authority, here's a very brief 80-page booklet on that by Jonathan Lehman that just came out. Who wants to read this? Who would be helped by this? Charles? Just take it back quickly. Um, and then who particularly needs help in understanding baptism? Bobby Jameson has written a little 80-page booklet on this, Understanding Baptism. Um, Shaker's going to bring that one back. Great. All right, here is one of my all-time favorite books. I make every intern write a paper on their own life when they come in based on looking at their life through the lens of C.J. Mahaney's book on humility. I think if you're not humble, you should not be in pastoral ministry. So, Charles, um, Jordan, no, what's your name? Jordan. Jordan. Yep, here it comes. Uh, J.I. Packer's Evangelism of the Sovereignty of God. I probably get out more copies of this book than any other book. This is such a useful book. Four simple lectures talking about the sovereignty of God and evangelism. Shaker's going to give a copy of that one out. Uh, look at this. One of the best things ever written on the Incarnation. It's 1,700 years old on the Incarnation by Athanasius. I mean, this is a good thing for you to read and know about. Uh, he argues well for this. And from the sublimely ancient to the ridiculously recent, Russ Moore's excellent book, Onward. Uh, Russ just has a great way of approaching uh, the skeptics and the unbelievers, and you get that attitude in this book, and I commend it to you. It's a, a wonderful book to read. Do not take it without reading it. All right? Now, when you give out books like this, be sure and do not neglect those traditional pastoral gifts of shame and guilt. Uh, those pastoral tools are greatly underused these days, and you should really encourage people, do not take the book unless you will read it. This is not just to bless your library. This is to to get into your brain soon and make them feel bad about that. So bad that if three weeks from now they haven't read it, they'll bring you the book back, kind of hang-facedly. And you can then give it to somebody who will read it, all right? Also, realize that different services, as your congregation gathers, provide different opportunities to vary how you might edify the congregation by preaching. So maybe you could have a Sunday evening sermon, which could be the same theme as the morning sermon to sort of build on it, but it could take a text from the opposite testament. Uh, and some other preacher could preach, and the sermon could deliberately be of a different size and scope so as to better help other members. Furthermore, consider the role of preaching and edifying the church by using the sermon to build up the ministry of others in your congregation. So would you like to see your church becoming a greater seminary, more of a seedbed for gospel ministry? Well, consider opportunities you might have for others to preach God's Word so that they can test their gifts and allow the congregation to benefit from their ministry. Perhaps begin to recognize Christ's gift of a new elder among your congregation. Uh, does the congregation have government employees? Uh, does it have teachers, missionaries, future staff members, editors, lawyers, other elders, other church staff, architects, interns, future seminarians, businessmen, laborers, and others who would be encouraged themselves by opportunity to preach and encourage others? Friends, the main use of preaching is to build up the congregation. The one other use I want to point to, just take a few moments to consider, is to evangelize. The effect of our preaching should not just be to edify the church, but it should also be to evangelize. <clears throat> In much of our preaching, nothing is lost, and much could be gained by considering the text, the points of the sermon, and the illustrations we use from the perspective of non-Christians. First of all, keeping this perspective in mind is more edifying for Christians because it helps the preacher to remember why he's speaking about a particular point. It puts it in its largest context. Remembering we have non-Christians around us can help Christians to speak more accurately and engagingly of unbelievers around us. They're not the people out there that we caricature. They're the questions that many of us have that we consider. We're reminded of the importance of God's truth. We're given fresh reason to praise God. And at the same time, our engagement with non-Christians is enriched as you model for your congregation how you would interact with an unbeliever on a particular point. So as one who used to be an agnostic, I know that trying to describe things from a materialistic, naturalistic perspective will sometimes help to sharpen my appreciation for God's truth. The inadequacies, the inadequacies of my unbelieving presuppositions help me to know how to place a truth, how to position it and deploy it, 
I was having a conversation with a friend last night. He was asking me about the problem of evil. I said I had no answer for it. And I said the Christian answer for it is better than everybody else's answer for it. So I have no answer for it that's ultimately satisfying in and of itself. And yet the thing that we have that's, that's uh, what we know about how to address the problem of evil is in my mind far more satisfying than any other explanation out there. So for the, for the Christian preacher, as for all evangelists, it's better not to assume interest in the sermon. Uh, why would the non-Christian consider what you're saying to be of any use to them at all? Uh, we're preaching to the spiritually dead. But we're preaching in the expectation that God will use our sermon to awaken some. So, for example, and I chose this almost from random just to give you a very normal example from my preaching. When I was discussing from 1 Corinthians 8 about Paul's teaching about our knowledge being guided by love, I addressed non-Christians in the congregation. Well, I'll do this every sermon. I'll say, if you're here and you're not a Christian, and I'll just talk to people who know themselves to be non-Christians. I'm aware there may be some non-Christians sitting there who think of themselves as Christians. I understand that. But I am addressing specifically, like last Sunday, there was a, a couple from Pakistan there. There was a Hindu couple in church for the first time ever. Uh, there, you know, there, there, we will have Jewish people in church. We will have you know, self-consciously non-religious people. So this is, every Sunday they're sitting there. And so I will self-consciously address them, non-Christians. My friend, if you're here as a non-Christian this morning, I wonder how this is sounding to you. Have you realized that you weren't made to care about only yourself? For that matter, you weren't even made to care about yourself primarily and supremely. In the same way that we are made naturally dependent on our parents for generation and our earliest survival, on a spouse of the opposite gender sexually, so we were made to be spiritually dependent on someone else, on God himself. But according to the Bible, we've each sinned and separated ourselves from God. We have rejected him by choosing to be our own lords. And this self-centeredness leaves us open to the certain judgment of God, the right judgment of God, who will one day judge us. I never like to say he must judge us. That sounds like there's some external rule he must obey, and we're slightly apologizing for God's character. I always like to say he will, because he's good, because he loves what is right. We are made in his image, and in judging us, he will display his glory by vindicating his own character. Now, friends, there's a lot in there. And I finished preaching the gospel more fully later in the sermon. But I pray that some who were there were given something to think about and that they were unsettled in their unbelief. I'm a big believer in Socratic time bombs. I love just to lob a question out there lovingly, sincerely, earnestly for the unbeliever and then just move on to another topic. Not try to resolve it for them. Just let it sit there. I pray that they heard a message which caused the image of God to stir within them and their conscience to convict them. Never be afraid to address the non-Christian directly in preaching. Again and again, I've had non-Christians come up to me after the service, tell me they appreciated being addressed publicly because it let them know it was okay for them to be there. Because if they're not of our religion, they may not even know if it's really okay for them to be in this meeting. And so when I address them in a friendly fashion publicly, it's like, oh, thank you. You know, then all of a sudden they realize it's okay. We're not a secret society. They haven't had to enter surreptitiously. And they haven't been wrong to be at the meeting of some kind of secret religious fraternity. And for church members, then it provides us, say, a model of how to speak to non-Christians. One last thing to say before we have done with this topic of the use of preaching for today. The minister should be alert to opportunities that special circumstances present. And there's two that I think of particularly I want to talk about very briefly here at the end. That's when you're newly installed as a pastor and funerals. Uh, first of all, preaching as a newly installed minister of a congregation presents the preacher with unique opportunities and challenges. You have to think very carefully, what kind of preaching is this congregation accustomed to? Are there sermons of previous pastors that I could quickly go read or listen to or the audio? Was the congregation prospering under that preaching? Are there likely to be any obstacles in beginning a more expositional ministry here if they weren't accustomed to that? Furthermore, does the congregation understand the centrality of the sermon in their life together? I think too many evangelical services that I visit are nothing so much as sort of 19th century religious variety shows with a kind of warm welcome and then a dramatic reading and some entertaining music and some rousing choruses, whether you have a choir, an organ, or an electronic band. And those assembled are more devoted to the praise band or the choir than they are to the preached word. Their theology will show in part in time that they allot to 
in the time that they allot to the sermon. So I think the new minister will want to be careful about preaching longer than the congregation is accustomed to hearing, but he'll also want to consider how he can increase the hunger for God's word. One more consideration for the special situation that the new minister finds himself in, what should he preach on? Uh, I think there are clear advantages to beginning a ministry at a church by preaching through a gospel. If the congregation is just being gathered, there is an appropriateness about beginning it around the teaching, teaching around the life and death and resurrection of Christ. If the congregation is an existing one, no part of Scripture is more useful in evangelizing the unbelievers and in instructing young Christians continuing to challenge the mature saints and unsettling the religious hypocrites. The Gospels are just awesome to preach through. The other Gospel situation to be noted is preaching at a funeral. Uh, Spurgeon said that deathbeds are grand schools for us. McShane was wont to visit his sick or dying hearers on the Saturday afternoon, for as he told Dr. James Hamilton, before preaching, he liked to look over the verge. This is no unseemly, exploitative, macabre sentiment. Friends, could there be a more glorious place to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ than in a place where death seems to reign? Preaching is used by God to build His church and to give life to those who are spiritually dead. Is there a more noble task? Friends, this is the way that the Lord Jesus Christ will extend His reign around the world.